again. Uh, this is a panel on uh, uh, legal academics and uh, legal technology. And uh, I'm John McGinnis. And I'll just say a few words and then introduce our speakers very briefly. You have their bios uh, before you. Um, uh, one of the most important aspects, I think, of uh, the way uh, technology is changing our world is that uh, uh, a space like law can have no influence from, uh, very little influence from computation. And then at a certain point, it can become a, um, uh, a huge, if not dominating, presence. Uh, uh, the way I look at that is when I was a, uh, in high school, I was on my uh, chess team and could beat any computer uh, at chess. Of course, in 1997, Big Blue beat the greatest uh, chess player in the world at the time, and now I'm regularly humiliated by my smartphone. I think that's uh, really where we may be on the cusp uh, of in the legal uh, space. Uh, for a long time, I think uh, computation had very little influence on uh, law. Uh, but after uh, Watson and other uh, developments recently, it seems that it could have a very important, uh, if not dominating, presence. And legal institutions, I think, have some difficulty in reacting to the rapidity of that change. Uh, all institutions do, but perhaps legal institutions, which in some sense are built on looking at the past, have a difficulty. And legal academia may have the greatest difficulty of all, because uh, legal academics are mostly tenured a very long time ago. Uh, before legal tech became a presence. And uh, one thing I've learned, it's hard to teach a law professor new tricks. Um, uh, but it's very, and that's for why it's so unfortunate today that we have, I think, some uh, of the most interesting uh, legal academics working and thinking about the uh, legal space. So really, I think only a dozen to a score of, uh, of people in the uh, legal academia who do that. And so what I'm first going to ask uh, uh, my colleagues is to describe a little of their research, and then we'll uh, have some uh, questions, and I certainly will open it to the floor for your questions. And so first, uh, we'll begin with uh, George Trantis. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm going to divide my remarks into two. I'll be really, really brief at the beginning. Uh, the one is to address sort of the, the challenge that John mentioned that law schools have in um, integrating legal tech. Uh, in their in their programs, and then I'll talk a little bit about my own teaching and research as it engages uh, legal tech. Um, I think it's fair to say that at this point, the schools that I'm familiar of re recognize the legal uh, sort of the imperative of bringing more technology uh, into uh, into the curriculum and into the classrooms. I think that they because of uh, our students and our students coming in being far more tech savvy, they're very receptive to opportunities uh, to engage in legal tech. They don't see it in the formal curriculum yet, but that doesn't stop them from doing a lot of things and uh, programs uh, and centers like Codex have been very important resources uh, for them. And um, it's also clear that they uh, appreciate that 20 years, 10, probably 10 years from now, legal practice is going to be very different than what it is today. Notwithstanding what we hear about the legal profession being resistant to change, I think certainly those of us here, but our students in particular, know that, that change is coming, and change is going to come uh, very quickly. So it has been a challenge for law schools who, uh, who need to respond to that uh, to figure out how to do it. So I'm not going to talk about what are the skills that are necessary uh, to impart or to help the students with, but I think a big challenge is how, how to do it uh, for them. And the reason that it's a challenge is, one, as John said, that the faculty is not particularly skilled in technology. They were hired for, with different criteria in mind for the most part, especially the people like me who, who have been around uh, law schools for a long, for a long time. The second one is that uh, legal tech is moving extremely rapidly, and if you focused on giving them the knowledge, uh, cutting edge knowledge today, well, it's, it's going to be old hat two, three, four years ago, uh, from now, pardon me, when, when they need it. And the third um, that I've been particularly conscious of here and, uh, has been the, the uh, scarcity of student time. 
Uh, students, uh, uh, there are a lot of other skills beyond tech uh, savviness and tech knowledge and legal tech that they need to integrate into their, into their skill set. Uh, we tell them that we're living in a global world and therefore they ought to know more about laws and cultures and politics and economics in other parts of the world. So that, that has to be added in. Uh, we tell them that uh, softer skills or professional skills like empathy and client relations and business skills, those are very important things that we may not have been teaching before. We need to teach, uh, uh, we need to teach now. Um, and it's, there aren't any low-hanging fruits to say, well, you know, that course in Kant and the law, well, you don't need that anymore, so why don't you switch your time? You know, they're not taking those courses. That's not what they're spending their time doing. And so to try to fit in some of this education that they need within a three-year period is, is really, really daunting. And you have to look for programs that aren't necessarily, you know, three-unit courses or two-unit courses, other ways of helping them to acquire these skills and to build these skills on, on their own. I'm a big fan of, of eventually getting to a more of a pervasive approach where it's within all our courses that technology plays an essential role. As I'll mention in a moment, I've been teaching contracts for 26, 27 years. And it should be in my contracts class in which they get introduced to concepts of smart contracts, not in a separate legal tech course. And I'm also old enough to remember when law and economics was just a new movement in, in the academy. And there was a law and economics course that people would take to learn about economic analysis of law. Well, as probably the most successful movement of the last couple of generations, what has made it successful is that economics has found its place inside all the courses. And sure, there may be a law and economics course in, in, in schools, but really the economic analysis the students are learning integrated in their, own, uh, in their own courses. And I think that that's the success that we should be looking for uh, in tech. As I said, I'm not going to get into what, whether it's artificial intelligence or the blockchain or data analytics or whatever. But whatever it is, we have to strive for it to be better integrated uh, in, the, in the courses. So I'm not going to talk very much, but I, I did say I was going to switch to uh, how I think uh, in my own uh, research and teaching. Uh, it's important. One of the reasons to put it in the course is because it not only describes the technology doesn't just only describe the practice of contracts in the future, but it also sheds some, some light on some very classic issues that we've been struggling with in contract law and in other areas of law for you know, generations. So when you think about a contract and the role of the state, you know, they say that the difference between an agreement and a contract is a contract is legally binding, whereas an agreement uh, is not. It's just a, it could be just a casual agreement. So well, what role does the state play? The state plays an enforcement role. In other words, uh, most contracts you can reduce to a, long, to a short or long series of if-then statements, right? Uh, and usually, under a regime that has damages as the remedy, usually the then ultimately is a payment of values, a payment of money. You know, if you do this, if, you, if this and this happens, these conditions are satisfied and you don't deliver, then you need to pay money. Well, if, all, if what the state is doing is enforcing that payment, well, the blockchain, we know, can do a terrific job simply transferring value from one person uh, to another without the need of an intermediary like the court of the state. If what do the courts do is, is fact find, they look at the realized state of the world, again, if you think of the blockchain as a distributed uh, database, you can imagine that fact finding can be done a lot through the, through the blockchain with the, with, the, uh, with the addition of some external uh, data feeds as well and an algorithm that helps to sort of synthesize all the data that comes in. The tough part, and despite all the time that's spent in law school talking about consideration and the mailbox rules and so on, really most of what courts do is interpret documents, is to try to figure out what the intent of the parties is. And that's where I think the big challenge lies uh, in, for instance, harnessing the blockchain and smart contracts to be able to substitute for more uh, conventional contracts. And um, what's hard about it is, is this, that for a long time, one of the key issues of contract design is whether to use precise or vague terms, or rules and standards, as we like to call them in law school. Do you have a precise term, or do you use best efforts, commercial reasonableness, material change? 
And we do know, you just have to observe, that parties like to put those terms in contracts. And so, and um, we can talk about a little bit more, and Aaron knows far more in this area than I do, but, you know, the blockchain uh, and computable contracts are just don't, they're not going to be able to handle those terms, right? And so either the parties themselves are going to have to figure out, okay, let's be more precise. We can't just, you know, uh, kick this ball over to the courts and let them figure out what best efforts or good faith uh, are and to fill in the gaps there. They have to do some work up front. Maybe, the, maybe computable contracts will make it easy for them, but that's an issue that's been around before. This sheds new light on it, and I think it sheds new light in a way that uh, helps us understand uh, that classic tension between vague and precise terms uh, in contracts. That's why it's great for me to introduce it into my first year contracts course and not um, silo it as a separate uh, topic for another course. Thank you. Okay, uh, Aaron Wright. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Wright. I'm a clinical uh, law professor at Cardozo Law School. Um, I'm, I kind of sit in the intersection of law and technology. I'm a lawyer, um, self-taught programmer. I've started companies. Uh, I, I sold a company. I program uh, to this day. Um, and what I do is uh, I teach uh, a clinic, and we counsel young technology companies, so they really get immersed in, in technology, so they really understand it. I teach a a uh, coding for lawyers course where we begin to teach lawyers the basics of uh, understanding how these systems work, how databases work, because I think that's elemental uh, to building kind of the next generation of lawyer. Uh, and it, just in, in my <coughs> clinic research uh, is going to piggyback on what George has talked about, but it's on blockchain technology. Um, so I, th I, fr I thought first I just would kind of give an overview of uh, just blockchains and what they can be used for and kind of explain how I think that may shape and impact uh, what law, law schools do in the future. Uh, so we talked about it a little bit in some of the other panels, but at a, at a basic level, a blockchain is just a massively distributed database uh, that's not really owned by any one party, right? It's collectively managed by a network of computers. So this seems like seemingly dry, boring, we're talking about data, uh, but I, uh, it's been argued, and I think it, there's a, a fairly persuasive argument that it's really a platform to really reimagine many of the, the systems that we have now, ranging from finance to government, uh, to the way we, that we actually put together uh, contracts. Um, and all these systems are very important, right? They, they underlie our entire society. Uh, so it's, we're at a moment, I think, where we can begin to look at this technology and go back to first principles and say, you know, let's try to rebuild some of these things. And if we were, were going to rebuild them, what would they look like? Um, so, you know, just some of the use cases that have been kind of outlined for it. Um, so you can now, using a blockchain and associated smart contracts, which is a bit of code that can transfer an asset, uh, you can replicate the functionality of the New York Stock Exchange. You can settle stocks without the need for the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so that's pretty profound. You can, there's been proof of, proof of concepts that have been put together about derivatives. So if you want to do swaps, you can now uh, begin to model them out using source code and manage that, that execution uh, in a self-executing way. So the code enforces all the parts of the agreement, maybe not all the agreement, but at least parts of it, uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily need any outside input. Um, another big use case, which, uh, which hasn't really been touched upon, but I think is going to be important, is that it can help facilitate the emerging Internet of Things, right? We're going to have a lot of devices connected to the Internet. Cisco, IBM, they put it in the you know, billions of devices that are going to be connected to the Internet. Well, those, those devices, are some of which are going to be autonomous, those devices are going to need to communicate with one another. They're, they may transact with one another. They may have their own bank accounts. You may pay them. Uh, you can't do that with paper-based legal agreements. And smart contracts um, are going to fit into that, uh, um, that equation. Uh, and some people really think that that's going to drive the coordination of all of our interconnected devices. Because it's not really owned by any one party, uh, it's just owned by everybody, uh, that has certain advantages. We don't necessarily want Google or IBM or Microsoft or one of these large technology companies to control the entire Internet of Things, both from a security perspective, uh, also you know, just to, to really extract the full value of that, uh, that ecosystem. They're also being bundled together to create virtual companies, uh, the first of which was actually launched about a week ago. Uh, these are called decentralized organizations or decentralized autonomous organizations. So these are uh, corporate entities that are not really managed just by legal agreements like uh, bylaws, uh, you know, partnership agreements, uh, limited liability company agreements, uh, but really by source code. Uh, so the source code is what manages and dictates the relationships between the parties. Um, so the first one got launched. It was called the it's called the DAO. D A O. It was uh, it, it's been crowdfunded, um, 
and it was anticipated to raise $500,000. It's raised $150 million. Uh, and it's, it's got wide support from a number of different parties. Uh, whether or not that complies with existing laws is a separate issue, but it's, I think we're seeing some really interesting experimentation with organizations, uh, probably for the first time since the limited liability company came out, uh, came out in, in the 70s. And um, you know, just to give you a flavor of what people are saying about this technology, uh, some have likened it to the internet. So they, they view it as another part of the internet stack. So you know, much like we have the HTTP protocol and SMTP for email and FTP for file transfer, blockchains are viewed as kind of another protocol, core protocol that's going to build out the internet. The World Economic Forum has claimed that it's going to decentralize almost every single aspect of the financial services industry. I'm going to get more and more hyperbolic just to, to ratchet it up. <laughs> uh, the Bank of International Settlements, a consortium of central banks, uh, suggested that the endpoint of blockchain technology and virtual currencies is basically the elimination of central banks and the, the or at least uh, significant competition with it. And most significantly, this is really out, out there, the, the UK scientific of, office said that blockchain technology's impact may be more impactful than the Magna Carta. So I think that that's probably the hype, uh, the peak of hype. Uh, I think that a lot of this stuff's exaggerated, but uh, I think it's really, it's going to, we're entering into a phase over the next 10, 20, plus years, much like we did you know, starting in the you know, early 90s to now with the internet, of just seeing a next wave of decentralization of the internet, a reimagination of the internet, and some of the, uh, the core functionality that really hasn't been touched by networked and connected technologies, we're going to begin to see an increasingly uh, transformed. And I think that really informs what we do at law schools, right? If we're trying to build lawyers uh, for not just the next three years or the next 10 years, but for their careers, you know, how do we best train them? And that's part of the reason why uh, at Cardoza we've decided to begin to really roll out some more technical training for our students so that they really can begin to understand these technologies. My research assistant has programmed smart contracts. I've, been pro I've programmed them. He built a really basic auction agreement. Uh, and it won, he was able to win a hackathon, which he was completely you know, enthralled about, got $5,000. Um, but I think we're going to really see this technology not just uh, uh, get harnessed by lawyers, but I think, at least, especially in finance, it's really looked at to kind of eliminate some of the lawyers, right? So instead of having to go to lawyers to put together these agreements, they can get a lawyer to put the agreement together once, and if it works, presumably, then they don't, the areas that are really fixed and, and really uh, formulaic in finance, you no longer need to, need to use a lawyer to do that. Um, and I think we're going to begin to see that kind of emerge uh, in more and more sectors. And a lot of times this code is open source, so you can begin to just see people, uh, the development of contracts basically resemble software, where people begin to develop libraries, that becomes kind of standard, and you kind of move on to the next thing. So I think that may be part of the process of what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take for this stuff to happen. Um, you know, I think it's hard to predict in the short term, but I think over the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to begin to see that. And I think that that's uh, an important reason why law school should take the lead and really help facilitate this, both, both on the research end and helping to develop this technology, uh, but also to making sure that our students are appropriately trained so that they're able to not just understand this, but really lead, uh, you know, lead this next wave of, of innovation. Okay, Bill Henderson. Uh, well, I'm absolutely uh, delighted uh, to be here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of break the theme of the, uh, of the uh, kind of self-executing contracts and things like that and uh, uh, talk and kind of um, talk about uh, uh, my research, which I call more applied uh, 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 research. And I'm here I'm defining technology later. Peter Thiel, who's a graduate of this law school, defines it in his book uh, 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 Zero to One, which is basically any kind of know-how that leads to great gains in efficiency, quality, anything that, uh, uh, that it's just a new way of, of solving uh, problems. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, digitized. And Peter's got pretty good uh, 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 bona fides on the technology front, but he looks at uh, uh, technology much more capaciously. And John started off by uh, mentioning that uh, legal education is slow to change because we get tenure a long time ago, uh, and uh, and that uh, that that uh, that uh, that. That the microeconomics of that disfavor innovation in the legal academy. Well, I got tenure in 2008, and I can remember uh, the first th thought I had was, is that now I don't have to kind of write for these law reviews anymore. And uh, and uh, my last uh, article before tenure was in the Stanford Law Review on on, on the large uh, law firm stuff. And really, what was so exciting to me about the research that I was doing was, is like, wow, there's a lot of practical stuff in here that uh, that could be used to to solve practical problems. And and uh, and I really took uh, my uh, my tenure as an opportunity. So I got about five or six years before they noticed that I'm really doing what I want to do, as opposed to cranking on another you know uh, you know top ten law journal piece. And uh, 
at this particular point in uh, time, uh, if you guys remember like 2008, 2007, 2006, the market like this was just white hot. It was the exact opposite of what was happening in legal education uh, today. And uh, I looked at it, I said, this, this is clearly mispricing talent. There's a clearly something, we're paying too much for some talent, we're paying way too little, and this market is kind of going to blow up. And, uh, and so I started a, a, a company with the, uh, called Lawyer Metrics uh, with basically alumni funds. I put in some of my own money, way too much money that my wife was comfortable with. Uh, but we took in alumni money, and we were going to benefit the law school. And I've run it for five years, and we eventually sold it. Uh, to the access a group a successful uh, exit uh, and I was really happy about that my law school uh, uh, got a check uh, 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 for it but basically the technology we were offering is basically just helping the lawyers use data to make decisions uh, because largely uh, they sit there and they invent their lar the, the, the the habit is if you're making pretty good money you 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 look for the set of facts that are most conveniently available and you and you make decisions on that one and there was no kind of market punishment for making decisions just abstracting your own facts not gathering them in a systematic way uh, but the world has become much more competitive and so uh, we found a greater uptake uh, for our services and uh, uh, Broadly speaking, what does the company uh, do? We pretty much big data sets for, for data visualization so that lawyers can access the insights from, from data. Uh, I do a lot of things regarding just looking at the broader market and, and, and following technology companies, legal technology companies that are eating away traditional market share, basically so lawyers have a canvas because lawyers are busy servicing their clients. Somebody has to pull together the data so that they can begin to conceptualize and have context for the business that the businesses are operating. And last thing is human capital uh, valuation. And uh, my colleague, David Wilkins, who was one of my tenure reviewers, said, Bill, when are you going to start writing about everything you've learned uh, from these private client engagements you've been doing? Well, we finally accumulated enough, enough data so that we could talk about it. And so I was just published an article in the PD Quarterly, uh, which is a practitioner's journal so uh, the, uh, for, for, for basically professional development uh, in the law firm context that, that, that went uh, uh, point by point on how to solve the diversity problem in law firms. And uh, part of it is looking at peer reviewed uh, stuff, but a lot of it is our own company supplied data. And I'm extremely proud that we've, we've knitted together the science. If you want to solve the, uh, the, the diversity problem in your law firm, oh, we have the data and we have a system uh, that we're pretty much certain will solve the problem. And it, and it goes back 100 years worth of data, history, quantitative, qualitative data. So I'm very proud of that. We're also doing, uh, 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 so a lot of things on human capital evaluation, behavioral interviews, biographical inventories, upward reviews, engagement surveys, where you, we're helping uh, organizations uh, make better decisions using that. But also we're, we're, we're building scorecards related to diversity uh, using e-billing data, which are huge tranches of data that coming from the, you know, how law firms get paid. And we're putting it together with demographic data, and we're actually looking to see uh, uh, how firms are allocating their spend uh, in, uh, in terms of diversity, and we're actually beginning to evaluate, making the business case for you know diverse uh, teams actually get better outcomes. We're also working on scorecarding systems for a feedback loop that, that, that feed innovation between buyer and supplier. Kind of think about Toyota. Sometimes in my talks, I talk about the three fa Henderson family cars. My 96 Caravan, my 2003 Volkswagen Passat, and my 2014 Honda Accord. What do they all have in common? They all cost 23 grand, but my income has gone up five times since I bought the first uh, one. And that's a wonderful world to live in when quality goes, when, when quality goes like this and cost goes like that. Well, the same thing is going to happen in law. It's not so good for the producers if they mourn the way with the, the know-how we've done in the past, but there's a lot of things that uh, uh, open up as a result of that. And, and uh, I think that, that, that buyer-supplier dialogue is going to solve so many problems in our profession. And we're building the feedback loop, the technology feedback loop that feeds that. But there's a hell of a lot more talking and a hell of a lot less computer bits involved in this innovation than, than uh, I think people uh, might believe. So I, I think I've gone on for my five minutes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me on the panel. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk uh, mostly about my research, which I could sum up in the following question: What are lawyers good for? Uh, and I'll get, but I'll get to that in a minute. But I did want to pick up on some of the things that, that uh, George said, um, because I think that the issue of how to 
move technology into the law school curriculum is actually a, a fairly uh, important issue and the and kinds of things that George mentions as, as resistance to that kind of change. I've been very fortunate in that uh, I started a class uh, five or six years ago in which students collaborate with uh, outside organizations to build access to justice apps and we use a platform um, that is uh, 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 that, that's given to us by a small software company called Neotologic and the great thing about the platform is that uh, students don't need to know how to code and so the class has been fairly, the, the entry barrier to coming to the class is uh, fairly low but I've learned some lessons about how uh, a curriculum, how you can actually expand your curriculum and uh, embed more and more technology and technology skills in it. And I think the first lesson is that uh, it, students are driving it. Uh, so we've actually expanded what we're doing to actually add some uh, programming skills and some programming classes. We added a class, this is an example, we added a class, uh, we announced it in the fall, it's a computer programming for lawyers class. We announced it in the middle of exams and uh, we said there were gonna be 15 seats for it and 120 students tried to sign up. So they know something we don't know, uh, which is that this is gonna be more and more relevant. And the class, which I audited and would have passed had I gotten all the assignments in, I was told, uh, uh, was really about how to, you know, how to handle data. Data is the facts of today, right? It isn't about how you have to understand how, how you get data, how you clean data, how you organize data. And, it, it, and students get that. Um, so one, one of the ways in which you know, to move that kind of innovation into law school teaching, and obviously a, a place where a lot of resistance changes to have students move it. Second thing uh, that we've started to do is to partner with the computer science department at Georgetown. We've been talking about uh, teaching some joint courses. We're gonna hopefully knock wood and make a, an appointment soon of somebody who's actually gonna be appointed in both places. So that's, and the great thing is that actually computer scientists are actually interested, interested to talk into it. Who knew that it was possible? But they're really interested in expanding conversations about machine learning, artificial intelligence, data into the legal realm. They really actually see an opportunity for, you know, thinking, you know, having, disrupting or, or, or changing or taking all the questions that they're, that we're interested in and applying their techniques. So there are great par partnerships that are available there. And the last thing to mention, and, and uh, which uh, is that the place where there's the least, uh, uh, I think most law schools consider access to justice and a mission to do justice. That may be the first time that the J word was used in this conference, but I may use it a few times during my talk. But anyway, but that's what law schools, uh, and, you know, it's in, in law school's uh, uh, wheelhouse to talk about do justice or to teach our students to do justice. So access to justice, which is a huge conversation going on now, is a great place to sort of start having students build tools and you learn some digital technologies so they can build apps that increase access to justice and students love it. I mean, you build an app and we built apps with there have been thousands of users and, and the students love that they built something. So that's, those are three ways in which uh, I think that legal you can move technologies into legal education uh, where there'll be the, the least resistance. Uh, and then you have to pick off each of your colleagues one by one because it's, uh, it's more of a show rather than tell kind of experience. So let me just talk briefly about, I don't wanna, I may have used most of my time already, but let me talk a little bit about my research. So as I said earlier, the question for me is, uh, when are, you know, uh, what are lawyers good for? And I've been thinking about it, working on it in the personal legal services sphere. Uh, and so access to justice and uh, personal legal services here, by that I mean when lawyers represent individual clients with particular kinds of problems, whether it's divorce, housing, immigration, et cetera, right? La uh, landlord, tenant, uh, benefits, et cetera. And that's a space in which uh, Lawyers uh, really claim to have a particular role. I mean, there's an idealized role in which lawyers uh, uh, sort of further the objectives of their clients, they empower their clients, they enlist their clients to, you know, in, in terms of legal system, we've got a whole picture of the ideal of a lawyer, call it client-centered, call it, call it something else, uh, where lawyers are supposed to be furthering objectives and empowering and educating their clients. So that's kind of the ideal, and there's a tremendous resistance to using uh, technologies instead of lawyers. Why? Because it doesn't fit with the ideal. So we, um, for example, built self-help apps uh, and apps that are used by non-lawyers, uh, and the idea is you know, that if you're using technology instead of a lawyer, the technology must be second best. 
problem with that thesis is that, in fact, lawyers don't live up to that idea and in, in personal legal service, not because they're bad, not because they're unethical, but because they function in markets, and markets impose constraints. Uh, and so they don't have time to uh, spend time talking to their clients about their objectives, educate their clients about the legal system, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they're, they're really driven by having to earn a living. So, one, so, the, the, so, there, there's, so you can't assume that lawyers are necessarily better. There's obviously a research agenda, which is what makes for an effective lawyer? When does a lawyer make a difference, right? And it could be outcomes, it could be uh, empowering their clients, et cetera. And when do technologies do the same things or do them better, right? So that's one really, uh, I think that's sort of the, my research now and going forward is about that question, right? When can you take, when do technologies, and what are technologies, not necessarily always good. I mean, there are outcome studies that show that lawyers are much better in certain kinds of courts, right? And, you know, you wouldn't go to, um, most people would not want to go to law, to a court uh, armed with the technology as opposed to having a lawyer. And studies bear that out, that lawyers make a difference in outcome. But there are a lot of other settings, whether it's advisor, whether it's helping people get particular kinds of benefits, where it's not obvious that lawyers are better than technologies, at least well-designed technologies, right? And that's an important caveat. The technologies have to be well-designed. They have to have the good uh, user experience. They've got to be have beautiful interfaces, et cetera. Anyway, so that's that's one, uh, one important strand of research and questions going forward. The other question, and this is as much a, 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 a this is less of an empirical research agenda, but that is what happens to substantive justice. In other words, if, every, if people or individuals are getting access to the legal system via technologies, computational law, system of rules, then what happens to moving the law forward? What happens to uh, uh, lawyers who see, so, who see that a regulation contradicts a statute, a, regu a statute contradicts, uh, is unconstitutional, right? You would not, to put it in the simplest terms, get Brown versus Board of Education if all we had was computational law. And I think that's a huge challenge for all of us, right? That it's, it's you know, it, it, it's very exciting to think about technology, but I think we all have to reckon with the idea that we've got to think about where justice, substantive justice fits into the story. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay, well, I think there were some very interesting uh, comments there. I want to take two uh, that just emerged. Uh, I, I see some, uh, I guess, tension uh, between the idea of uh, putting technology within courses and having separate courses on technology. Of course, one could say, let's do both, uh, even after uh, uh, law and economics has penetrated almost every law school course. There remain courses in law and economics, but as George pointed out, out, we have scarce resources, scarce time. Um, uh, which, what kind of mixture are we going to see? I see on the one hand, there are real advantage to integrating them. On the other hand, how rapidly is that going to happen? I think in my own area of law, constitutional law, if I were to teach it uh, today, I would introduce a part of technology, something that, that I'm not sure how many people are familiar with, corpus linguistics, which is the idea that we now have databases of language and that really it's much better to look at those databases to precisify, as it were, the meaning of terms than to look at dictionaries, which after all only look at really the permissible terms that don't give you the, con the relevant context of terms. And so I think I would certainly introduce that in courses like statutory interpretation or constitutional law as ways of, of, of approximating meaning. I am not at all confident, however, uh, that any of my colleagues will do that anytime soon. And so I wonder uh, whether that's really an argument for some more cross-cutting courses, particularly if you think technology is moving faster than uh, 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 even than law and economics. On the other, on the other hand, some of these uh, 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 cross-cutting courses are, are very resource demanding of law school. So I wonder about, about thoughts on that mixture, which I thought came out of the various comments of either dedicated courses to technology or more integration. I'll take a crack at that. Uh, the, um, um, uh, I think that the frame here is kind of set us up to kind of put us in a box here. Do, 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 does the, do, we, do we put these things in the same course or we have two separate courses? I think maybe we should not have uh, think in terms of three credit hour blocks over a 13-week uh, uh, period. Uh, and I say this because uh, 
uh, uh, I'm part of this uh, initiative called this Techler uh, Accelerator that uh, is put together. It basically feeds legal operations uh, folks that are in, in start startups to, uh, to to legal departments. And basically, there's a there's a range of skills that you need to mix a business, technology, communication schools, leadership that has been put together over a four week uh, uh, credit, uh, four weeks uh, uh, curriculum, or three and a half weeks. The University of Colorado. My friend Bill Moose, who was a visiting professor there, said that he he would struggle to get it through because it looked too skills based. It looked it didn't look sufficiently academic enough. But my students have gone through this last two years in a row, and they came back to say, Professor Henderson, this is the most practical, useful course I've ever had, and we're having a perfect track record of placing 1L to 2L students in paid internships, getting incredibly high quality experience, and so. Uh, it's possible if to design curricula in such a way that the labor market says, yes, I like that, give me another. And, uh, and so uh, I, I'm of the camp that, that, uh, that uh, you know, John will ask later, what should the Legal Academy do? I don't know what they should do, uh, but, uh, but what will they do? Not very much. And, uh, and, and my own uh, 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 agenda here would be to design a group of people who actually teach certain skills that the, the labor market says, yes, we need somebody who has Tanita's skills that she imparts in her class uh, that might have what gets taught at the Techler Accelerator class, and then the labor market will clear this out very, very uh, quickly. I will say that in our own company, we're, we're preparing to, to go into executive ed because we know that there's certain, and Dan Katz, he places students all the time that, that basically on the, on the hard skills that he's teaching them. There's a huge opportunity here. Law schools will solve a lot of their problems if, in fact, they have a dedicated curricula uh, and they make friends with employers. And uh, uh, we only have to, you know, uh, you know, place 200 students a year to basically be number one in U.S. News and, and placement. Uh, we need to think about it in those in those uh, in those terms. But I think that this, you know, should we teach in this course, that course? I mean, the tenure faculty, the faculty meeting it drives me nuts. So uh, I, I think that. Uh, uh, you have to build something. It's about optimization and letting the labor market be impressed with your work product because they hire your people. So can I just pick up a little bit on that, which is Bill's last comment. As far as I can tell, as far as I'm concerned, get it where you can, t you know, take it where you can get it, which is to say it is, you know, when you have faculty who have tenure or, you know, working towards tenure and are very much set in their ways, you know, you've, you've got to sort of pick them, as I said earlier, pick them off one by one. If you can get a course in the curriculum that works, that's great. If you can get two people to add a unit to what they're doing in context, that's great too. So, I, and my feeling about the other question is which are the right courses to teach? Well, frankly, on one level, it doesn't matter, which is to say digital skills are digital skills. One of my, my colleague, Paul Ohm, likes to say once you've, and I think computer programmers all agree, you learn two languages, you can learn every single language under the sun. It's actually easier than French or Spanish. Uh, uh, so, so, and you know, learning to use the more advanced uh, features in Excel spreadsheets, that's you know, actually a, a tech skill. I mean, Excel is actually a software program. So it doesn't sure. matter which of the tech skills you teach, I don't think. I think it just matters that you get, you're teaching a, a way, a different way of thinking, problem solving, and that you know, in, in 15 years we can have, or let, maybe five years we can have a discussion about which worked the best for, for imparting certain kinds of skills. But right now it's like, you know, get in there and, and find whoever's an expert in something like this, or if you're an expert in something like that, teach it, and then, you know, let a, a thousand flowers bloom. Other comments? Sure. Um, so I, I agree. I think that you have to try different things and you have to see where you fit them. It doesn't have to be a credit. It can be a boot camp. Uh, you know, lots of things. And there's enough interest among the students in this, I think, uh, uh, to make uh, these various approaches worthwhile. I mentioned the obstacles that, that, that we face. I mean, obviously, we've been, we've been beating up on the, on the old tenured faculty folks. But, um, but, the other, but there are a lot of things that we have going for us. Uh, one is that I mentioned was the students who are far more tax savvy. They come in wanting to apply their tech to legal problems. Uh, and the second one is that the people in computer science and doing AI, they're very eager to get new applications. They see a lot of data in law. They're interested in the operation of legal institutions. And they're very eager to collaborate. 
And I think that we need to remember that there are opportunities on our own campuses uh, for this. And I should say, I, because I drew the comparison with law and economics, I think economists uh, you know, had a tool set. And they came out saying, give me new applications. And they saw law as being uh, uh, fruitful. But you know, when they talked about Pareto efficiency and so on, um, it might have been uh, attractive, in some, but it wasn't in the newspapers every day. I mean, you didn't read a newspaper and read about Pareto efficiency or or optimization, but you do read in the papers every day about data science and artificial intelligence. So it's it's in the air, it's in society. So I think that that is a very positive. Those are positive factors that can really help the move in that direction in law schools. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the only thing I'd add is kind of it's almost a kind of a bundle. So we have like a information governance cybersecurity pro program. In in that course, the students take apart a computer. Right? You, it's really hard to understand cybersecurity if you don't get your hands dirty and open up a computer. Uh, so that's that's an integrated. Uh, I mean, the reason we did the coding for lawyers course was uh, I just happened to notice that the students, when I was reviewing their applications for my clinic, they were t telling me that they were taking programming courses, and I was like, this is kind of silly. Why are they spending an extra X thousands of dollars to go outside the school when we can just provide that to them here? Uh, so I was just—I think it's important just to look at the kind of what the students are doing and what they're what they're saying. And um, I'm also not as uh, I've only been doing this for two years I, in private practice. Just knowing uh, and working with clients, I just know that there's demands for um, for lawyers to actually have technical skills. I mean, if you're going to do a large litigation now, you're going to get a big database. It's, it's unavoidable, right? Uh, if you're going to be dealing with experts, they're going to need to run reports. And oftentimes, those reports rely on data. Um, you know, if you're, if you're going to deal with IP or any information laws, they just you can't avoid it. So you need to know these things just to be a competent attorney at this point, point in time. So. I'm going to open up the questions in just a moment, if I might. But I'd like to ask one. Uh, prior question, and you will be the first uh, to ask a question, uh, which is uh, because I thought it was, and I hadn't planned to ask this question, but I thought um, um, uh, Professor Rostin's comment was very interesting about the concern about, well, where would necessarily justice, would it be crowded out by tech? I think this is a very deep uh, concern that goes back to um, the debate between two cultures that C.P. Snow began 60 um, years ago there's a there's a humanistic culture and there's a technical culture and how do they come together and you might think law schools have always been a place that where normativity is particularly important even when the social sciences have taken maybe a more technical approach and again we have george's very useful comparison to law and economics that had a uh, at least efficiency if it also had a normative aspect and then people who reacted against efficiency as the only had a kind of normative, led to a kind of normative discussion. But you might worry that the focus on tech is really going to be the home's focus. What, uh, what, what I mean by law is what the courts will do in fact and nothing else. And we're going to be great predictors uh, and great uh, maybe grinders of syllogisms from current law. Is that, a, is that a concern? And how should legal education think about incorporating legal tech without perhaps uh, and gaining those tools without losing, uh, I think, what Professor Rothstein see seizes its soul. So if I may put it in those somewhat grand yeah, terms. Grand might, terms right. Pardon? Right. Well, so, um, although I feel like I started to, I posed the first part of the question, so maybe these, the, the, the rest of our panel, but I'm, I'm also happy to, to think about it a little bit. At least, you know, I, my feeling about it is that lawyers are not disappearing anytime soon and the extent to which, so that it's not as if we're going to have a world that suddenly lawyers are completely displaced and technology and rule-based systems simply take over. And so there are two, so that's one issue. But the, the other two uh, ways that I think about it, and this is, uh, uh, it, it is really in the context of, uh, of you know, access to justice, which is that if you build the right tools, then actually people, not lawyers, will be concerned about justice. That is to say, once they actually understand the law and understand what benefits, you know, that they don't get benefits because there's some unfair uh, regulatory system or the immigration system really uh, 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 creates problems for them, then they actually will be educated, empowered, and actually be able to uh, uh, move the ball forward on issues of norm uh, normativity, as you were to use, which is to say that lawyers don't have to be front and center in that story. The second uh, 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 
way a second response is simply the data actually makes a difference which is to say data can actually tell us where you know where lawyers are needed where civil rights lawyers are needed where legal service lawyers are needed and that it will it rather than have it be a top-down enterprise where lawyers say oh I should bring a civil rights case because this regulation doesn't fit the statute well it actually matters whether it affects you know a hundred people thousand people or two hundred thousand people and that's a that's a question that data is going to answer so it may actually make the sort of normative how to think about the normative questions may actually focus it focus those questions yeah so of course we've we've collapsed this the different technological sort of tools that we've had the data science the artificial intelligence and so on so so we need to be careful in answering this question in being specific as to which group we are referring to but let me take one example that I think brings your a general example that brings your concern into focus John which is decision-making by computer algorithm right if 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 decision dispute resolution was made simply by computer algorithm the concern is there that the algorithm itself would have some embedded discrimination some embedded unfairness and some embedded bias and we're really worried about that and our humanistic values may it may may raise a concern about that you know I think it's a much more complicated question because of course when the humans were making decisions they were biased they discriminated they were unfair as well and at least with a code we can actually open it up a little bit and 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 detect the source of bias and so on whereas it was a black box when it was a judge or or it was a jury so it's not always so I think that you raise an absolutely essential and core question that law schools in particular ought to be concerned about but my example is just that it's it's actually quite it'll be quite complicated and worth a lot of thinking and discussion I mean I don't see them as being mutually exclusive I think I think if you develop software you know that software is always has biases right there's politics involved in software if you just look to Bitcoin as an example the first block that was written it was written in reaction to the financial crisis and that was the reason for it and it's imbued whether or not you agree with it or not with a very libertarian bent to it right there's politics baked into that software and I think that's part of our role as educators we're teaching lawyers how to work with technology we would want to also teach them to build technology with with you know social justice and other broader notions of justice in mind and I think that we can do that and I think if you build a more open you know open legal system where the data is more open where you where people have access to information and to tools then I think that we can actually increase justice and I think that there is efficiency can increase that access to justice and I think ultimately a lot of the legal technology is about increasing efficiency and and I think if you increase efficiency you should be able to drive down cost and hopefully in a meaningful way well yes just well time I think for one question but I wanted to make sure that you got your question in I think that's absolutely right and law schools are doing nothing about it in other words we're not we're just not having that conversation yet but I think it's absolutely right I mean that's the issue is you know if you're trying to get veterans benefits it's not obvious that a lawyer is better than that it's an incredibly complicated regulatory regime so well is a lawyer going to know all the way around it no they've got to look it up and they make mistakes and if you if you 
uh, embed it correctly in the software, then you're going to have a more reliable system. But it depends, on, you know. So I, I totally agree with you. Uh, generally speaking, the access to justice conversation isn't happening in law schools. So that's actually the first conversation that has to happen. That's right, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, well, maybe we have time for one more question then. Uh, thanks. So you mentioned the tenured faculty may not have the incentive to change. I just got an appointment to teach a contract, so I have uh, none of those disincentives. Uh, so congratulations now for someone starting out first year teaching contracts. Um, teaching things like smart contracts is obviously going to enhance practice writing skills. On the other hand, there's a limited amount of time, and you need to prepare your students for the bar exam and for any number of other things. Uh, some of the students may be interested by using technology, others may be turned off by it. Uh, thoughts from the experience on the panel about how to integrate these things, whether to integrate these things, and when to integrate them for someone who would like to add legal technology to the classroom but is not sure how to do that while fulfilling the main obligation of making sure the students pass the bar and, uh, and, and join the general practice. Well, I'm happy to talk offline because I, I can think of things that can be abbreviated, but I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, uh, you know, maybe not spend as much time on consideration, but uh, you know, other people might think that's an important topic. Uh, no, you know, I th I think that. Um, um, well, I'll be re really brief. I think you're going to find there are lots of things that you want to include, and you're scarce on time, so there'll be a constant. Uh, pressured trying to find efficiencies. And I think one of the points that I was starting to make uh, in my remarks earlier is that the smart contracting technology can be a, a lens through which you can tackle or you can address with the class some of the more classic issues that arise in, in first year contracts. I'd be happy to give you other examples. Cool. Okay. Well, I think, uh, well, we may have, okay. I one. just want to make one comment on access. Yeah, so that, there's the challenge, right? So I view it as teaching math, you know, do you start with a calculator or do you have to learn, you know, basic arithmetic first? It's tricky. So, I mean, I, I obviously, I, I could build up some systems to do uh, contract automation. I run a transactional clinic. So uh, that would be great for the clients, but would it be great for the students? And if my, if my, my primary client is my students and to teach them uh, the, what's going to best serve them, uh, I think that's, I know that that's a conversation a lot of people are having. Uh, there was just a clinical conference, and that was one of the conversations that we're talking that we we tried to work through. It's a, it's not an easy, it's not an easy, out. yeah, it, yeah. We just have to figure it out. So, well, well, thank you very much. Uh, back to the uh, main forum.